This week on Christian World News, hope for peace. Will the summit between North and South Korea's leaders bring change? Or is it just a pipe dream? Why millions of Christians around the world are praying and fasting for the Korean Peninsula. Plus, the false gods of North Korea, how the state religion is designed to replace Christianity and make gods out of the nation's leaders. And miracle on the baseball field. This congressman survived a deadly attack and fought his way to recovery. Now he's giving thanks to God. Welcome everyone to this week's edition of Christian World News. I'm George Thomas. Indeed you are, and I'm Wendy Griffith. Thanks for being with us. Well, the leaders of North and South Korea met for a historic meeting this week. It was the first time a North Korean leader had ever crossed into South Korea since 1953. In a joint statement, both leaders agreed to achieving a nuclear-free Korean peninsula, but did not provide specific details on how to achieve that objective. In a tweet, President Donald Trump welcomed the meeting saying, good things are happening, but only time will tell. That's right. Meanwhile, Christian leaders say human rights atrocities in North Korea must be a top priority. CBN producer Emily Jones spoke with Suzanne Schulte of the North Korea Freedom Coalition. Schulte says that only prayer and fasting will make the difference. This actually came from a Congressional International Religious Freedom Caucus briefing in January where the, the foremost expert on Juche, which is really the religion of North Korea, said to combat the, the, the demonic principalities in North Korea, we need not to just pray, but we need to fast, calling on Almighty God on behalf of the people of North Korea who are suffering under the most brutal dictatorship in modern history. There's been a lot of movement from, the nor from North Korea in advance of the upcoming summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. Do you see this as an answer to prayer? Nothing is impossible with God. But when it comes to Kim Jong-un, we should at the very least be demanding that he release the Americans that he's holding. We should be demanding that he stop torturing his own people when they try to escape. There's certain things that I believe could be a strong signal that there's a change in the, the heart of Kim Jong-un, but I just don't see that happening at all. This last week of April is North Korea Freedom Week. Tell us what's happening and the significance of this week. Well, one of the things that came up uh, during last year's North Korea Freedom Week, one of the things that the defectors kept saying, the truth will set them free. One young lady who was part of the elites, she lived in Pyongyang. She and her mom ran a restaurant there that was frequented by the elites. And she said that the brainwashing is so much that when Kim Jong-il died, she thought she was going to die. Her whole family thought they were going to die because he was their God. And she said when they find out he's not God, if they learn about the one true God, it changes everything. And so we decided to make this theme of North Korea Freedom Week, the truth will set them free. And we're going to focus attention all that week on the work that the North Korean defectors who have escaped are doing through radio broadcast. And we have a daily radio broadcast that's produced by North Koreans that, that's a partnership between American churches and North Korean defectors that's broadcasting every day into North Korea. We're going to focus on uh, the balloon launches that are sending in leaflets of information and also the work of getting in um, through cross-border transfers, USBs and SDs which is with information, loaded with information uh, for the people of North Korea to know about the outside world. And so that's what our focus is going to be on, what the North Korean defectors are doing to change the hearts and minds of the people of North Korea. The truth will set them free. Powerful words. Keep North Korea in your prayers. By the way, Shorty's group uh, is hosting North Korea Freedom Week in Seoul. Religious and human rights groups are uh, pushing uh, our in Seoul, pushing for change. Learn how you can help at our website, cbnnews.com. There's been so much saber rattling between North Korea and the U.S. that many feared it would lead to nuclear war. CBN's Paul Strand reports some believers are saying the real way to win against North Korea is to conquer its false religion with the truth of the gospel. People believe North Korea is so deadly and dangerous for Christians and other religious believers because it's godless. But actually, the opposite is true. Kim Jong-un is worshipped as a god, and an entire religion is built around idolizing the Kim dynasty. 
Suzanne Schulte and Tom Belke recently testified on Capitol Hill about the Juche religion that was clamped on the hermit kingdom by Kim Jong-un's grandfather. He set himself up as God, his son up, Kim Jong-il, is, is the Jesus figure, and Juche, their philosophy as the Holy Spirit. It's why Schulte believes North Korea suffers so much evil. That whole construct of how that regime is established is a perversion of the Christian gospel message. Belki has written Juche, a Christian study of North Korea's state religion. Americans and people that are outside of North Korea do not understand how North Koreans think if they don't understand Juche religion and how it's been brainwashed. And they are brainwashed to idolize him from their entire, through their entire lives. And they in fact have a, a prayer they say, thank you Father Kim Il-sung after a meal. They have what we would know as the Apostles' Creed that's changed to worship the Kim dictatorship. North Korea thinks America is so dangerous it keeps threatening to nuke the U.S. But Belki insists the regime actually is more afraid of the power of the gospel than it is of the American superpower. The Bible and the Christian gospel is the most destabilizing thing to the North Korean regime. Schulte says the creator of Juche, who later defected, told her... It was only the gospel message that could break free the stranglehold over the people of North Korea with the brainwashing of this system that they're suffering under. Because it undermines Kim's supposed godlike authority. The Bible teaches that there is a, a supreme sovereign God over all men, including the dict dictator. Belki thinks President Trump's name calling, like labeling the dictator Little Rocket Man, has a similar and significant impact. I think it should be intensified because uh, what he's essentially doing, it's, it's both counterintuitive and brilliant. He's, he's actually mocking their God. Schulte thinks North Koreans, if given the chance, would easily pick Christianity's message over Kim's juche. You are a beloved child of God and created to be free. And they teach you are a slave of the Kim family and you need to devote your entire lives and sacrifice and die for the Kim family. Schulte is backing free North Korea radio as one way to broadcast the gospel into the hermit kingdom at least one hour a day. She's heard it's led to miracles, like in one suffering town. All the children were dying uh, from typhoid fever. This one woman who listened to the Free North Korea broadcast wrote down the Bible verses, and she said, I'm going to pray these over my daughter. And if it's true, if God's real, then my daughter will be healed. And her daughter was the only one that survived that epidemic. Belki believes it's power like that, not nukes and missiles, that'll win a victory over the Kim's evil. These spiritual powers and principalities that control the, uh, that undergird the North Korean regime have to be broken. That's not going to happen simply by normal policies. That has to happen by prayer and fasting, and that's the work of the church. Paul Strand, CBN News, Capitol Hill. Coming up, the fight for Alfie Evans. His parents wanted to take their brain-damaged child to Italy for treatment. Why did a judge in Britain say no? Prayer is a communication with God. It's a powerful exchange between God and man. We're going to answer many of your questions in Answered Prayer, How to Pray Effectively and See God Work in Your Life. In Pat Robertson's latest DVD, Answered Prayer, you'll learn the biblical principles of prayer and how to get your prayers answered and hear miraculous stories of answers to prayer from Pat's own faith-filled journey. We share some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. Plus, you'll see dramatic, true stories of life-changing answers to prayer. God proves himself time and time again. He's in the room with us, answering people's prayers. I think I survived because God has a bigger plan for my life. The doctor was just like, I've never seen anything like this before. He hears your prayers. I never saw this coming. Every great work of God is preceded by prayer. Answered Prayer. How to pray effectively and see God work in your life. Call now or go to CBN.com. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. My husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. 
And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. And welcome back to Christian World News. A UK government denies a family the right to child care for its child. Such a sad story, and that story leads to our World Watch report. A UK court refused to allow Alfie Evans, a toddler suffering from an unknown brain condition, to leave the country for medical treatment. On Monday, the hospital took Alfie off life support against his parents' wishes. However, the baby continued to defy expectations by breathing on his own. The Italian government offered Alfie citizenship and continued care at a hospital in Rome. But the UK denied him the freedom to travel abroad. This would not happen in the United States because a court in the United States is charged with allowing the parent to direct the upbringing of their children. And those parents are, going to, are bound by law to do what's best in the best interests of those children. Those, those rules don't exist over in the UK. Mm. Dr. Com encourages people to pray for baby Alfie and his family. Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina is fighting harder than ever for the release of American pastor Andrew Brunson, who remains imprisoned in Turkey. Tillis traveled to Turkey last week for Brunson's trial. Now he's back in the U.S. and is rallying lawmakers to sign a letter to the Turkish government calling for the pastor's release. I've invested the time to go there, look the pastor eye to eye, look the judges eye to eye, look at the prison guards eye to eye, and I'm convinced that this is a risk to every single American. And every single one of you should put yourself in Pastor Brunson's place and go from here and make sure people know what's going on there. Pastor Brunson's trial resumes in May. Wendy. People around the world gathered in commemoration of the 1.5 million people killed during the Armenian Genocide more than 100 years ago. April 24th is the Day of Remembrance because it was on that day in 1915 that the Ottoman army began one of the worst mass eliminations of a people group in world history. Armenians, many of them Christians, were starved, raped, murdered, or forced from their ancestral homelands. While Turkey denies the genocide, 20 countries, including Russia, Germany, and Canada, recognize the event. Evangelicals played a pivotal role in President Trump's election, and now they have unprecedented access to the Oval Office. That puts them and their faith in the spotlight. Like never before, George, and some say the media has hijacked the term evangelical, making it more a set of political beliefs than an expression of Christianity. Recently, CBN's Mark Martin asked Professor Corny Becker about the proper definition of evangelical and how evangelicals view politics and President Trump. Dr. Becker, what sets evangelical Christians apart from other Christians? So historically, scholars have defined four commitments that evangelical Christians have made. The first one is a commitment to the idea that every human being must have a conversion experience. To use biblical language, be born again in, in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The second commitment is to have a high view of Scripture, that Scripture is not only inerrant, but certainly the infallible rule of faith and practice. The third commitment, very importantly, is to focus on the centrality of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins, that the essence of the gospel is what Christ did on the cross for us, his death and his resurrection, that indeed it's this commitment that can change our world. And lastly, to activism, not just political activism, but activism that lines up with the social values that we find within Scripture. Do you think the term evangelical has been hijacked and is now more of a political term than anything else? Right. So there are many forces out there in the world that would love to indeed divide this block of Christians. And so often this term is no longer used as a positive term, but sometimes in a derogative manner. And so I think it's been somewhat hijacked um, by folks that are not Christians. And they are trying to define who evangelicals indeed should be.
Do you think that the president has divided evangelicals? I do not think so. In actual fact, I think he's done quite the opposite. I think um, <clears throat> the current president, and especially in the run-up to the election, has united a large group of Christians around values that are truly important for them. And you can find more stories about the church's uh, work around the world at our Christian World News webpage. Okay, so still ahead, nearly one year after being targeted for assassination, Congressman Steve Scalise shares the incredible journey, the miraculous journey of his recovery. That story, back in a moment. Parents, the Superbook Bible app is a great way to get your child reading the Bible because in today's busy world, we can use some help. The free Superbook Bible app has fun stuff your kids will love. They'll have a blast learning the Bible, playing great games, watching cool videos, discovering heroes in the Bible. They'll have fun while they learn God's Word. The Superbook Kids Bible app, available now. Life, it's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it, I came to give you life, life to the fullest, life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your every day. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life. Live it fully. CBN.com. All of a sudden, everything starts to let go the ledge and everything. Right when I realized that I was buried, I knew I was gonna die. So I just cried out to God, said, God, what do I do? And I heard him just as loud as you're talking to me, go find your brother. See miraculous stories like this in Answered Prayer. Pat Robertson's latest teaching uncovers the keys to help you get results, break down barriers, and build dynamic faith to receive your Answered Prayer. Available now. Almost a year ago, Republican lawmakers were practicing for their annual charity baseball game when a gunman opened fire on them. Playing on that field was Majority Whip Steve Scalise, who was seriously wounded, but he miraculously survived. Abigail Robertson talked with Congressman Scalise about that fateful day and his recovery. June 14th, 2017 could have been a massacre, but thanks to God's protection, over a dozen Republican congressmen who were practicing on this field for their annual charity baseball game are still with us today, giving their firsthand accounts of the big and little miracles that saved their lives. And you can't explain some of the things that happened on that ball field except that God performed real miracles. It was a nice summer morning in Virginia when Steve Scalise joined his congressional teammates to prepare for their big game. And then we're just out there playing baseball on a field, you know, a bunch of guys, you know, feeling like kids again. And then all of a sudden I heard a noise and I thought it was the backfire of a tractor. But Congressman Trent Kelly, who served in Iraq, knew immediately that was no tractor. He turned to the direction of the gunshots and found himself staring straight down the barrel of a rifle, only about 15 feet away. And I looked him dead in his face, and he had the most evil, most sinister look. At that point, the shooter fired three shots directly at Kelly. Miraculously, none hit him, and one bullet he sure would have struck him ricocheted off this fence, likely saving his life. So the, the calmness and the way that I acted and the things that I did uh, were directly attributable to uh, he guides us as long as... Uh, is we're following his steps. That doesn't mean he'll always protect us. Sometimes that's not in his plans, but, uh, but he definitely guided my steps that day. Kelly could then only watch as Scalise fell to the ground after being shot in the left hip. I went down, I, uh, you know, I crawled away, uh, and then eventually my arms and legs just gave out. And I didn't know how bad I was hit, um, but I could feel numb and, you know, I, I could still hear a lot of gunshots going off. 
Scalise started to pray. And I prayed and asked him for very specific things. And, uh, you know, at that point, it almost was like this calm came over me uh, because I, I just really felt like God was going to take care of me. And boy, did he ever. Capitol Police officers David Bailey and Crystal Griner, assigned to Scalise that morning, fired at the shooter. Although wounded in the process, they eventually took him down. Meanwhile, Congressman Brad Winstrup, a former combat surgeon, rushed onto the field to treat Scalise. Uh, Brad came out and applied a tourniquet to where the bleeding was. Uh, my, my trauma surgeon later said if that tourniquet wasn't applied, uh, I would have bled out on the field. I wouldn't have made it. That was just one of many miracles that day. When EMTs arrived, they quickly loaded Scalise into an ambulance headed for George Washington University Hospital. Given rush hour traffic, the ambulance hardly moved. Then, one EMT noticed a helicopter flying towards the baseball field. Even though they had no communication with the chopper, they made the call to turn around, hoping it was coming to pick up Scalise. And sure enough, the helicopter landed and it was there to pick me up. And four minutes later, I'm in the emergency room at MedStar Hospital. And uh, they said maybe one more minute and I wouldn't have made it. So uh, the fact that that happened, I would have died in the ambulance. I mean, there's no doubt about it. When Scalise reached the hospital, he had no blood pressure. Uh, and you talk to most doctors, will tell you, you're not gonna make it if you have a zero blood pressure when you arrive. Uh, they had to replenish my blood supply, literally putting more than two times the amount of blood that a human body has into me because I had so much internal bleeding. He lay unconscious for three days following the shooting before finally waking up. Even in the hospital, he faced danger after developing a life-threatening infection. They weren't sure whether I was going to make it those first few days, but, you know, finally I did. And, you know, thank God for the miracles and for the prayers all around the country. Just the unbelievable, overwhelming uh, amount of prayers and support I got from people that I know and I don't know. And uh, I'm so thankful for that. The bullet shattered Scalise's femur and seriously damaged his hip and pelvis, which took steel plates to rebuild. What did the doctors tell you about your recovery those first few weeks in the hospital? Uh, you know, they were still trying to figure out just how I was going to uh, respond, how my body was going to re respond to all the injuries. And, um, you know, they, they feel confident that I'll, uh, you know, they definitely said I'd be able to walk again. It's just a question of what I need crutches and would I be able to run again? And a lot of that's still in question because there's, there's still a lot of nerve and, uh, and muscle damage. In the face of all that Scalise told me, there was no doubt in his mind he'd be back on the hill one day. I mean, I love doing this job. I, I missed it a lot after those first few weeks. Once I started to kind of think about getting better, uh, the next thing I thought about was getting back to work. Less than four months later, on September 28th, Scalise triumphantly returned to Congress praising the Lord for sparing his life. When I was laying out on that ball field, the first thing I did once I was down and I couldn't move anymore is I just started to pray. And, and I will tell you, it gave me an unbelievable sense of calm, knowing that at that point it was in God's hands. Congressman Kelly told CBN News he wasn't surprised to see the majority whip back so soon after the shooting. You know, we just continued to pray for him and, uh, and, and I won't say I knew he was coming back. I will say this. I knew if it was God's will, he was going to be back. And if not, he had something, something greater planned for all of us. Scalise says while he's been a man of faith for a long time, he's kept it relatively private. Now, he's happy to share the amazing things God has done in his life with the world. And, and I think the fact that it's been able to touch so many people, um, I'm, I'm happy to help continue to spread that word. I am not... A minister. I'm not a you know a preacher. I uh, I'm a member of Congress who has a great job. I love being able to to be a part of of you know helping you know turn around a country and the greatest country in the history of the world, but a country that was founded on a belief in God. Scalise says he's a living example that prayer makes a difference. The fact that I get to to have people come up to me and say I prayed for you, and I get to tell them your prayers have been answered, and and those prayers have been so helpful to me. The, the prayers really did help give me strength. And to him, it's offensive when people say otherwise. They need those prayers. I needed those prayers. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, how dare somebody say, don't pray for the, the people that have been injured by, uh, you know, by a tragedy, uh, you know, go and try to 
use that as an opportunity to hijack their tragedy, push your agenda. I think that's offensive. Scalise truly returned to the Hill a new man. So you can take a tragedy and go, that's awful that that happened, and it is. But I have no doubt that God's hands were involved in that from start to finish. Although his recovery has been remarkable, challenges still lie ahead. Scalise faces rigorous physical therapy and asks for continued prayer for complete healing. Please pray that, uh, that my nerves that have been injured from the, uh, the attack can, can come back and function, and a lot of them are, and I'm so blessed to, you know, be able to be able to do what the things I do now. It's hard to say if Scalise will ever resume his position at second base, but his teammates are determined to keep the 109-year-old charity event going strong. This year's game takes place here at Nationals Park on June 14th, exactly one year after the shooting in Alexandria. Before our interview ended, Congressman Scalise wanted to make sure he let our CBN News audience know how much your prayers have meant to him. I can tell you uh, the power of prayer is real, it's powerful, and it was incredibly helpful to give me the strength I needed to, to come back. So thanks for the prayers. Uh, they truly were uh, needed and, and appreciated. And we will keep praying for him. We'll stay with us. We'll be right back. Hello? Is this thing on? Hey, kids. Do you love games? And do you love discovering things? Yeah! Well, do you? Yeah! Then you're going to love this. It's the new free Superbook Kids Bible app. You can play games, watch videos, find answers to your questions, and a whole lot more. The new Superbook Kids Bible app. Free downloads available on iTunes and Google Play now. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. My husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. When you give, smiles grow bigger. When you care, homes are happier. When you comfort, the hurt goes away. When we all come together to love, miracles happen. Well, that is it for this week's edition of Christian World News. I hope you have been blessed by all the stories we have brought you this week. I know I was. I was too. All right, well, until next week, goodbye from all of us here. God bless you. <laughs>